every place on which you set your feet, I give to you. And I have given to you dominion and authority. And every place you set your feet becomes holy ground because my presence becomes manifest there. My kingdom, my, my will being done right there in your presence. You are my temple. You are my holy ones. And when you walk, you take my glory and bring it into every place on which your feet set. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Can we have our Eastgate picture up there? Do we have it moving? The blue Eastgate picture? That we don't have. Okay. That's a Sunday morning one. There's Lori. Yes, and Diane. Good morning, Tammy and Betty and everybody. Glad to see you on Tuesday morning. And we're starting a new book, The Gospel of Mark. Um, and I prayed this morning. I, I kind of feet. I'm walking out on a limb here like, okay, God, uh, tell me where, where, where we're going. I always do that, though. <laughs> and uh, we always end up in a good place. He's never taken us he, and dropped us off yet, has he? No, he has not. And y'all been sitting under my teaching for years, and you've seen me wobble out, and we land somewhere. <laughs> so that's what you call faith. <laughs> and we walk by faith. Okay, so I'm just going to do an introduction to the Gospel of Mark, which I do this before I start a book, I study about the book. <laughs> and so I bring to you what I study. Um, the book of Acts ended abruptly, leaving us with more questions than answers. With we awful glad that Luke wrote what he wrote. wrote. We awful glad he gave us the information he did. It's just a little more, you know. We want more. However, the letters of Peter and Paul, as well as the Gospel of Mark, fill in some of the blanks for us. Uh, we found a lot of information as I was went out and talked the, the letters that Paul wrote after the Book of Acts, and it opens up a lot for us when you put it all together. So as I begin the study of Mark, I now understand why the Holy Spirit is leading us in this direction. Uh, we cannot separate the writing of Mark's gospel from 1st and 2nd Peter. They were written at the same time, in the same place, during the same, pro probably the last year of Peter's life. Um, that its author was John Mark is attested by such second century church writers as Papias, Irenaeus, and Clement of Alexandria and others. Y'all remember, I happen to remember as I was, as I was researching some of this, um, years ago, Kathy Walters came and she told me I was a desert father. Lord told her I said, the desert bob. Of course, I had looked that up. And then she never backed off of it. Even as she came years later, she still confirmed that I was a desert father. <laughs> well, when I looked up the desert fathers, I thought, oh, Lord, I just love to pick their minds <laughs> and study them. And of course, it, uh, because of the language, uh, even when it uh, converted to English, it's not easy to follow them sometimes. So, you know, if God's going to make me a desert father, I can tell y'all I got a long way to go if I compare to those fellows, okay? But I do like studying first and second century church writers because they were there. They wrote it down. And, and, um, 
as I studied this, both Mark and Luke, uh, they say that they were part of the 70. Both Mark and Luke were part of the 70. And uh, Clement, you know, <coughs> he was there. So John Mark lived in Jerusalem with Mary, his mother, during, during the early church period. He was a young man. Uh, one of the things that I read was he was born 9 A.D. Um, so he was, what, nine years, nine or ten years younger than Jesus. Okay. Um, he accompanied Mark and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, and we know that uh, he abandoned that for some reason and got in trouble with Paul. Later on, he served with Barnabas in Cyprus, and later still, he was at Rome with Peter and with Paul, and Scripture confirms it. So he was with both of them. 1 Peter 5.13 The church in Babylon elects together with you. I didn't touch that. Son, you may have to come fix it. Cause I don't know if I'm strong. There, I you know. I got it. Yeah, my hands are stronger. Isn't that good? Thank you. A couple of weeks ago, I didn't have that grip. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The church in Babylon elect to gather with you, greet you, and so does Mark, my son. Elect to gather with you. God has been speaking to me lately about the elect. I won't go into it because I don't have enough information yet, but he has been. You know, I, tell, I think I mentioned recently that I've heard over and over, and God does this every time a choosing is going on. And there are many choosings that God does. Many are called, but few are chosen. And there's a lot of, uh, when I posted that on Facebook, I got a lot of comments that all you have to do is say yes or, uh, you know, whatever, everybody's chosen. Well, my Bible doesn't say that. Many are called, but few are chosen. So my daughter asked me on Facebook, she just told me, what does that mean? You know, I don't know what that means, Mother, because she knows she's called, okay? <laughs> and, uh, so she, you know, what, what does that mean? And so I told her, I said, well, I received a call when I was 16. But God didn't choose me for public ministry until I was 48 or 49, somewhere along in there. That was when I got the call for what I call full-time public ministry. Or that's when I was chosen, I'll put it that way, for full-time public ministry. Now, in between there, I served the Lord in every kind of way I could do. You know, I clean commodes, taught vacation Bible school, taught Sunday school, painted walls, whatever I could do to serve the Lord any way I could. And I just figured that was my calling until one day another call came. So, um, I don't, I, there's a, to me, in my understanding of that, there is a maturity that I had to go through, a dying to my flesh. I mean, I was pretty much dead when he called me, just so y'all know. I was pretty much dead and then walking when I got when I got the call to pastor as far as I was concerned. So um, that's that's been my my that's my testimony. Is I was called at sixteen and I knew when I had the call. I was on my knees in prayer at a Methodist church, and I saw this light up on the on the platform, and uh, the voice said to me, "I have called you." And as I've told you before, from my culture where I came from, the only thing a woman could do was sing in choir or be a missionary. I couldn't sing. And at that time, there was no way my parents were going to let me be a missionary. So I wasn't sure what that was going to look like. Okay, I am digressing here. I don't know why. Somebody needs to hear this. Mm -hmm. And in addition to many are called and few are chosen, the Lord has been talking to me about his elect. But it just so happens I've, that was 
quickened to me when I read this. The church in Babylon elect together with you. Now, Babylon is here used by Peter as a code word for Rome. He is not in Babylon. He is in Rome when he wrote 1 Peter 5.13. And the reason they use code words, and, and as John did too, is because they were killing uh, Christians. I mean, Nero was at that point when he was in the dungeon, when Peter was in the dungeon, when he wrote First and Second Peter. We didn't pretty much know Second Peter was written from the dungeon. We know First Peter was written from Rome. At that point, uh, you, everything was written in code, and we may get to the point where we'll have to write in code. Okay, so Peter addressed his first epistle uh, to the Christians in Rome. Thus Peter tells his brethren of the fiery trial which was to try them, alluding to the extension of the Neronian persecution. Mark was with Peter when this letter was written because he said, um, the election greet you, so does Mark, my son. So, that we know. The second epistle of Peter was written soon after the first and was addressed to the same churches and was written from Rome. The author now contemplated the near approach of his death and so that the advice he here gives may be regarded as his dying instructions. As long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be, may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Paul wrote from prison before his death, 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Legend has it that before Paul's execution, Peter, Peter spoke these words to him as he was going off to be beheaded. Go in peace preacher of good tidings and guide of the salvation of the just. Now that's legend, not scripture, but I think it's beautiful. And it describes Paul perfectly and it was it was written by one of these first century or second century fathers. So I forgot I didn't I didn't know which one but I didn't look it up. Um Okay, so John Mark would have arrived in Rome before the death of Paul, it would seem. I can't prove that. Um, some historians think Peter was crucified one year later. Others on the same day. I have taught it from the viewpoint that they were both crucified on the same day. I do not have the word of the Lord on that. I just felt it flowed well when I was teaching it and presented it as a theory. And this is what they're saying, not as the gospel truth, okay? Uh, if the Lord speaks to me by something, I will tell you what the Lord says. If it's written in the Word, I'll tell you what the Word says. But if it's something I'm studying, I'll tell you what that other person says, okay? <clears throat> um. That it was while Mark was at Rome that he wrote this gospel is attested by Arrhenius, Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, Eusebius, and Jerome. And these are all, I guess we can call them desert fathers. We can call them uh, first century fathers of the church. Evidence of this can be concluded from the gospel itself and a considerable number of Latin terms which Mark uses. And this further validates that Mark's gospel was written primarily for Christians in Rome. 
it is clear it was written for Gentiles. Uh, this is indicated by the way in which Jewish customs and terms are carefully explained. If you were writing to Jews, you wouldn't have to put an explanation behind the, the Jewish customs. There is no evidence of Mark having been an eyewitness of most of the events in Jesus' life, which he describes in this gospel. There is a story, and I've preached on this before, that the young man mentioned in chapter 14, uh, 51, 52, is the author's anonymous allusion to himself. And I did preach on that. I found that story somewhere in one of my things, and I liked it, and I preached it. Um, it is now held almost universally in the 19th century. This is when it came in in the 19th century. That Mark's was the earliest gospel. And that it was used as a source for the writing of the gospels according to Matthew and Luke. Augustine, on the contrary, regarded Matt, Mark as having produced his gospel by abridging the more extended um, record of Matthew. Just giving y'all information, okay? That Mark's main source for the writing of the gospel was the preaching and instruction of the apostle Peter is attested. No one disputes that. It's attested by Papias, Justin, Irenaeus, and Clement of Alexandria. And a fellow by the name of Herion, I found this in, where did I find this? Matthew Henry's. He quote, quote, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, being sent from Rome by brethren, wrote a concise gospel. Um, one of these guys said that uh, Peter didn't know languages, he, he wasn't a writer, he, you know. But see, he had a Sylvanius writing for him, and he had Mark interpreting for him. Another, another guy, y'all probably heard of him, Tertullian, wrote, Mark, the interpreter of Peter, delivered in writing the things which had been preached by Peter. So when we go through Mark, if we take this as Peter preaching, it brings a whole new apostolic apostolic level of anointing, which is what I'm going for. Okay? Which is what I'm asking the Lord to release through this gospel that as we preach it, and the gospel of Jesus Christ carries its own power, the word of God carries its own power. And what we do is just open our mouths. So I'm asking and seeking the Lord. Okay, Pete, this is Peter's, what Peter preached. Mark wrote it down. Lord, what Peter preached, I pray that that apostolic anointing will be released out to your church. Do y'all see what I'm going for? Okay, anointing on that, yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Just ask it, you shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Whew. Also, the prominence of Peter in the story, including allusions to him which none but himself would probably have recalled. Peter is present in almost all the scenes. Um, in 1 Peter 5, 1, Peter implies that he witnessed Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, the Gospels, you know, we have John there and Mary and um, the mother of Jesus and of who, is at the, who is at the foot of the cross, but there's no mention. Peter ran off to some crow, had talked to him. <laughs> a, a rooster a cock crow a rooster had to go talk to Peter <laughs> give Peter a talking to but in 1 Peter 5 1 
Uh, he, Peter writes, The elders which are among you exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So Paul, of course, there was more sufferings of Christ, but the suffering of Christ was the cross. And so he says he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter was one of the very few who were present. The inclusion of such details suggests that the description in question originated by an eyewitness, which would not have been Mark. Peter's martyrdom by crucifixion was prophesied by Jesus. And see, that's what I just read that scripture. Now, uh, we could say that he was like Paul. You know, Jesus visited Paul, and Paul had a conversation with the Lord. And it would be, he said, it, you know, it would be better for the Philippians if he stayed, uh, uh, but it would be good to go. But God let him, God gave him a choice. And I think I mentioned that last week, how that was preached at Rahib's funeral. How God gave him a choice, and he used that scripture. God gave Paul a choice. Mm -hmm. And he very likely, if you're walking with the Lord very closely, when it comes your time to go to heaven, the Lord may very well give you a choice. Mm -hmm. And But with Peter, and Peter states, and I just read the scripture, that the Lord um, had already shown him how he would die. Um, I must put off this my tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus has shown me. So the Lord could very well have appeared to him and told him, look, you're getting ready to be crucified. We don't, one story says that he, he had his head chopped off another that he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to uh, be crucified the way Jesus was because he didn't feel worthy uh, if you go into the studying of those two views, it isn't like anyone has the gospel on that, okay? So, uh, whatever you want to believe, I'm good with that. John 21, 18 through 19. Most assuredly, I say to you, and this is Jesus prophesying to him of his death. When you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But now when you are old, you, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by which death he would glorify God. John 21, 18 through 19. There are early church writers who affirm that this occurred at Rome in connection with the Neronian persecution of the church. Whether Mark's gospel was written before or after Peter's death is of different opinions, even by the first century fathers. It seems obvious to me, you know, there's just some things that's obvious. Uh, Jenny and I were talking on the way to uh, Baton Rouge, and uh, Jenny's a detail person, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate y'all being detailed people. But you ought to know me well enough to not, now that I see the bottom line in the big picture. Y'all handle the details. <laughs> and that's, that's the way I view things. Bottom line, big picture. So to me, it's obvious that since Peter dictated the story to Mark, he wrote it down at the time of dictation, <laughs> or as Peter was preaching. Um, they do all agree it was written in the sixth de decade of the first century. Okay, because Peter was alive preaching, and by 67 or 68 AD, they both, both Paul and Peter, um, were assassinated. I'm not assassinated, but killed. Okay. So, we all agree
agree? Everybody agrees that Peter preached this, Mark wrote it down, and that it was written around, uh, well, it would have been written, some think it might have been written after Peter died. Well, I don't, because Mark would have written down what he said. That may not have been sent out until after Peter died. Okay. And y'all might be saying, why is this important? Well, it was what I was studying. And it was, I thought it was very interesting to me. Um, okay. Mark's gospel is to the point and full of action. A feature which would appeal to the practically minded Romans for whom it was primarily written. The proportion of it which is devoted to recording Jesus' deeds rather than his words is greater in Mark's gospel than in the others. But I was blessed um, when I was just reading through Mark recently. Um, in the early years of my ministry, one of the things I was persecuted for was being a teacher. Okay, uh, some people don't like teachers. Well, in the market, it clearly says that Jesus delivered them, he healed them, um, and then he taught them. Or he taught them before he healed. Jesus was a teacher. Okay. He was also an apostle. He was also an evangelist. He was, um, he was also a pastor. I mean, all five of the offices are in Jesus. But um, you will even find today, and I think part of it is a um, part of our education system somehow was not able to take a certain segment of our society that they are able to tolerate teaching. And right now, a teacher is not a popular ministry. Just give me a prophetic word an instant uh, microwave word and I'd like for it to happen the next two or three days and I have no patience to wait two or three years. That's pretty much the mentality of the church today. Do y'all agree with me? Oh, but I love this word. And I love to teach it. Last night I was praying beside my bed and I was praying for the oil to fall on the message and because I knew I had a lot of information in here. I was praying for the Holy Spirit to fall on it. And I said, Lord, have you just let me teach because I love it so much and you've just allowed it because I love it so much? You know, or am I really doing any good? But, I think sometimes he just lets me teach because I love it so much. <laughs> it is never a job for me. It is always an act of love. And I found something I wrote, put on Facebook this week. It was written by, um, I don't know who he was, some fellow. And, and it's true. Uh, you, you will do, duty can never do what love performs. You, love will give and give and give, yes. but duty re will not. Mm -hmm. I ask you, I want to tell you most people, they don't like teaching is because if you teach something and you earn it, then you're responsible. It's this is true. It's going to require some kind of response. Right. Right. But neither here nor there, I teach because I love it. And I think God just allows me to do it because I love it. That's all I know. Amen. Okay. Um, but primarily this is an action. And I am looking to also uh, extract from this book of Mark this great power of deliverance again. Because it's a strong deliverance book. And as I preach the gospel, I am looking for the power of deliverance because we've got to have it right now. There's so much demons yes. walking around. It's pitiful. Yes. Um, 
the, por the proportion of it which is devoted to recording Jesus' deeds rather than his, his, his words is greater in Mark's Gospels than in the others. Eighteen miracles are related as against only four full-scale parables. An unusually large number of Jesus' exercising of demons is emphasized. It's a, de it's a deliverance book. The thesis of this gospel is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Mark 1.1 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As the story unfolds, Mark shows Jesus to have been proclaimed Son of God by his Heavenly Father. Mark 1.1 1, 1. At his baptism by John. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, all of these people who think that Jesus wasn't born the Son of God and that he became the Son of God, they need to read Mark again. Mark 9, 7. <clears throat> a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Okay? He became a son by that which he suffered. His suffering did not a, a culminate, culminate and tell at the cross. But at the Mount of Transfiguration, God's calling him his beloved son. By demons who possess supernatural knowledge. Demons have more knowledge than some of the people who can read the Bible. Mark 3 11. <laughs> you pay you people out there. These, these demons in the Bible. Bible knows more than some of you. Mm -hmm, sure. Amen. The unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. Mark 5 7. He cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And every knee shall bow. <laughs> and every tongue confess. And the demons, do not doubt that the demons will know who you are. You've got a great big sign on you. <laughs> and it says, I am a Christian. I'm a born again son of God. I preach the gospel. I carry the glory of God and you walk into a room and every demon is going to take a shot at you. Yes. Get over it. Count it a, count it a blessing. Amen. Mark 12, 6 through 9. Therefore, still having one son, this is Jesus telling a parable about himself. His beloved, he also sent him to them, uh, last saying, I left something out there, sent them to them saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. That's going on now. That's going on now. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, let's get rid of the anointed ones and, 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 and we'll take what they got. We'll usurp it. Oh. The story's climax in, in Mark is that of a Roman nationality making this proclamation. 1539. When the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. And it's how Mark ends up, well, let's say Peter and Mark end up the gospel, uh, it, from, it, with a Roman declaring that he was the Son of God. And as I preach Sunday morning, uh, that through the apostles, through this ministry coming out of Rome, through the early church, the whole Western culture of Europe became a Christian name, Christian culture, became a Christian um, continent. 
the Western culture became Christian. So here Mark, at the end of his of this book, has a Roman say truly this, well, a, a, a Roman said it. Truly, this man was the son of God. And that, and, and um, we have to keep declaring it because Satan is trying to take over the culture. Mm -hmm. He's trying to take over the Christian culture. Yes. And as I said Sunday, not everybody in Europe got saved. But the culture was Christian. Mm -hmm. Even though there was enough sin to go around, but the whole culture was Christian. And same thing with America up until a, until Obama got in there. We still have a strong Christian culture over America, but that is not the strongest culture that now rules over America, over the people. And the people do not just automatically identify with the Christian culture anymore. They are identifying with a strange God. They are identifying with a demon God that is possessing the whole culture. Am I right? Amen. And that's what we got to fight. Yes. Now, you know, I'm going to go through here and I'm wanting to release the power of this gospel to do deliverance. Because our power comes through the word and through the blood and through the Holy Spirit. Okay. As I'm going through here, and we're, doing, we're all of this deliverance that Mark has written down, that Peter preached, I'm wanting that to be released. But people, we got to think the big picture. <laughs> and the bottom line, the big picture is we need to deliver a whole culture. Amen. We need to deliver our culture back to God. Yes. And the apostles did it. They cost them their life. They poured out their blood. Yes. But through their preaching and through the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God went through all of Europe, including Russia. Yes. Yes. Turned the world upside down and changed the whole yes. culture from worshiping demon powers, demon gods and goddesses to worshiping the one God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, that same power is still in this gospel. That's what I'm saying, church. Amen. This gospel has not lost its power. Just like Amen. Peter preached it, we got to preach it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This is what Peter preached. Yes. And I'm going after it. Lord Jesus. In Christian tradition, the four evangelists are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I, they're all my favorite. <laughs> Whichever one I preach, that's my favorite. Um, the authors of the four Gospels. They are called evangelists, a word meaning people who proclaim good news. The evangelists are, lack, are likened the sim, to the symbols which originated from the four living creatures in Ezekiel 1 that draw the throne chariot of God. These are images of Christ in his glory. The first living creature was a lion symbolizing his effectual working, his leadership, and royal power. Just so y'all know, I got a line on today. The second was like an ox, signifying his sacrificial and priestly order. But the third had the face of a man, an evident description of his event as a human being, that God came as a human, yes. was, God was born, a human son of man and son of God. The fourth was like a flying eagle. 
pointing out the gift of the Spirit hovering with his wings over the church. Therefore, all four Gospels are in accord with these things among which Christ is seated. And when I was putting this together, I was debating Joanne whether to preach on, uh, just for you to preach the uh, Golden Eagle. And uh, I'm going to come back to it. I don't know when. Maybe on a Sunday morning I'll do it. Um, okay, so let's look at these guys from the point. Not guys, Gospels. Matthew. A man, because the Gospel highlights Jesus' entry into this world. First, by presenting his family lineage. A family record of Jesus Christ, son of David and son of Abraham. And his incarnation and birth. Now, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. This then, according to Arrhenius, is the gospel of his humanity. For which reason is too that the character of a humble and meek man is kept through the whole gospel. The face of a man suggests human compassion and understanding for our fellow men. And this is the ability to enter others' joys and sorrows as they were, though they were their own. Number two, Mark, a winged lion. References the prophet Isaiah when he begins his gospel. Here begins the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In Isaiah, the prophet, it is written, I send my messenger before you to prepare your way. A herald, a voice in the desert crying, Make ready the way of the Lord, clear him a straight path. The voice in the desert crying reminds us one, reminds one of a lion's roar, and the prophetic spirit descending to earth reminds one of a winged message. The lion also signified royalty, an appropriate symbol of the Son of God. Number three is Luke, the winged ox. The face of an ox suggests patient and enduring service, even in weariness and painfulness. An ox works when he is called upon to do so, whether he feels like it or not. Oxen were used in temple sacrifices, and when the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Jerusalem, an ox and a fatling were sacrificed every six steps. Luke begins his gospel with the announcement of the birth of John the baptizer to his father, the priest Zechariah, who was offering sacrifices in the temple when the announcement came. Luke also includes the parable of the prodigal son in which the fatty calf is slaughtered, not only to celebrate the younger son's return, but also to foreshadow the joy we must have in receiving reconciliation through our most merciful, sa merciful Savior, who as priest offered himself in sacrifice to forgive our sins. Therefore, the winged ox reminds us of the priestly character of our Lord, his sacrifice for our redemption. And John, the rising eagle. The eagle is the book of John. Jesus is the son of God. It is the color blue, which is the color of the spirit, and its function is to take us into glory, and it is. The Gospel of John will take you into glory. When we took, well, hasn't been that long ago that I preached the whole book of the John, Gospel of John, and I grieved when I ended it because it surely took us into glory. The face of an eagle suggests living on a high spiritual plane above the things of the earth. I love that song we sang first this morning. You know, I'm going up higher. Don't trouble me. The same wind which causes other birds to seek shelter lifts the eagles to higher situations. We become animated by persecution, trials, and challenges. The eagle is animated. It goes higher. Don't be going around, somebody's after me, somebody's mean to me. 
Somebody doesn't like me. Be an eagle. Fly above that. And he, we are to become animated by persecution. We could just get there, church. And it doesn't come near me anymore. It just doesn't touch me. And don't come tell it, don't even come tell me that somebody said something about me and they didn't like me and they were mean to me. It won't touch me. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. it, 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 there's a place where it just doesn't come near you. Amen. And if we can get the whole church to that place, we're going to have some people, some eagles flying. You say, well, I'm an eagle, not a turkey. Well, if you're not an eagle, if you're letting everything everybody says affect how you respond or how you live or how you think. we got to be eagles. Finally, he ascended up in glorification as the eagle, far above all principality and power. And when God, when God gets the church to the place where we're flying as eagles, these principalities and powers that have taken over the culture of our nation, now God's going to have his church flying above them. Amen. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. This is the plan. Yes. This is the place where he's bringing us to. And we can either fly with turkeys or we can fly with eagles. Eagles. Do turkeys fly? Yeah. <laughs> Not much. Huh? Okay. Closing. What, how am I doing? I'm on time. It requires all four Gospels to reveal him who is altogether lovely. The four beasts of Revelation 4 through 5 reveal the corporate many membered Christ. In our Lord, we see first of all the man in his first 30 years. Then we see the lion as he goes forth in his ministry. Next, as the ox, he laid down his life as our only sacrifice for sins. Finally, he ascended up in glorification as the eagle. Far above all power and principality. According to church history, John Mark died April the 25th, 68 AD in Alexandria, Egypt. He started a church there. This would have been a year less, year or less from time of Peter and Paul's execution. Pretty much we know it's different, that they have different days. But it looks, looks to me like that, uh, they were executed around 67 or 68 A.D. So if he died in Alexandria, Egypt, in April of 68, uh, he didn't live long after Peter and Paul. Now, when I let Luke live to tell about 83 A.D., Um, history records these fathers that his body was dragged by a horse until he died and his body was crushed then they burned his body Christians gathered up his bones and ashes and decently interred them in 828 AD I forget one which there was a pope then but he was behind this stealing of uh, Mark's body. He, had, he sent people to steal Mark, to steal this John Mark's body. His remains were stolen from Alexandria and taken to Venice by two Venetian merchants and the help of two Greek monks. <laughs> so glory to God. 
and we'll start on Mark 1. And so y'all know what I'm going after. I'm going after the power of deliverance that St. Peter preached and delivered through this gospel that saved the whole continent. Amen. Yes, Lord. Because a big picture is we've got to not just be going after one little demon here and there. We're going to have to go after the whole United States of America. Amen. We're going to have to take back a culture which has become demon-possessed. Amen. There can't be any worse human sin on the earth than mutilating young children to change their gender. Amen. That has to be the worst sin that could possibly be done by men. Mm -mm -mm. And destroying them in the womb. And killing them, yes. Okay, so by that becoming a culture in our schools, mm -hmm. we are dealing with a demon-possessed culture. Mm-hmm. So we just, uh, that, you know, let's take care of the little demons, all right? But let's go for the big picture. Amen. 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 Yes, Lord. Lord. Bottom line, big picture. Yes. It is what it is. Okay, we're good? And it goes along with what we're going to be studying in Khan's book about the return of God. Yes. But see, I didn't plan that. Y'all been hearing me say, I think I'm supposed to start the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. Sanders already said, I don't know whether y'all have or not. You mentioned Romans, but I don't remember Mark either. Yeah, well, I, I've been mentioning it. Done. Uh, Praying, I say, I'm praying about starting the Gospel of Mark. Okay, well, here it is coinciding with us starting that book yeah. on the gods who have come in to take over not just America, but, but the world world. Okay, so the spread of the Gospel by the early apostles this triumphant, overcoming, glorious church, we're going to have to take it back. Right. Amen. Yes. Well, these, these demons, these gods that Con's talking about, they're like the forerunners for the Antichrist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like Jesus had a forerunner to John the Baptist. This is the forerunner. But the yeah. Antichrist. And, and we're still here. And they're going in the open doors of the churches now, too. Yep. Yeah. Well, they go through well, whatever door is open to them. Right. Okay. Just so y'all know where I think we're going with this. Okay. What y'all got? The word of God says we cannot declare that Jesus is Lord. Then you're not of God. Right. Okay, and when we do, when we don't acknowledge Him as the Lord, then uh, that what you're saying is we have a, a culture that is demon possessed because they will not acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Yeah. Yeah. They're making themselves God. That's right. Exalting themselves, exalting themselves, but higher than God, better than God. Yep. Now, the authority is in us to confront those demons, yes. to bring deliverance, and to release the Spirit of God, just like the early apostles did. Because the gates of hell will not come against the church. They cannot.
Yes. Hmm. Well, there's a song. I hear it. We will triumph in the Lord. We will triumph in the Lord. We will triumph like never before. For greater is he that makes us overcome. Overcome. We will walk in the power of his mind. We will shine forth his glorious light. For greater is he that makes us overcome. So where do we start, Pastor? When do we start what? Where do we start? How do we start? I mean, prayer, I guess, obviously. We're doing warfare on Wednesday nights. We're doing warfare on Wednesday nights. We're doing it on Sunday night. We're doing it on Tuesday morning. I'm doing it on Fridays at least once a month now. I've been kind of pulled back to once a month because I, I just don't have time to do it more than once a month right now. But I, on the 14th, she'll be in uh, Israel. So I'll, I'll be leading that prayer group on the 14th. Jennifer's coming on the maybe the 17th, somewhere along there. So, oh, building. I uh, talked to Tom um, briefly, and he's bringing someone to give us an estimate to put uh, drain, dr uh, drainage, gutters. gutters, thank you, around the building. Evidently, he's getting ready to start the bathrooms because he told me he's going to use, uh, um, I can't think of nothing now. See, my brain has been sheetrock. Sheet Sheetrock on the bathrooms, and I say, "Good, we we'll just put sheetrock all over the place. Be fine." So he's so he's talking to me. So he's he's getting ready to start these projects, and um, I confiscated that stone out there from him Sunday. <laughs> I walked out, saw that big stone, and I claimed it. I said, and I said. You know, he was standing there. I said, Tom, where'd this stone come from? I, can I have it? Because <laughs> I've been wanting this stone to paint Tim's name on it and when he was born and when he died. And Cheryl. Because, you know, Cheryl's $5,000 that she sent to the church back years ago, God's told me, Carolyn, at $5,000 coming in the mail, I want you to open up a building fund with it. The Lord chose her $5,000 to be part of the foundation Amen. of this church. Amen. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, Diane, can you paint letters and, and numbers? With stencils? Okay. I don't, I don't want it big uh, you know, just about that size because I want to put Tim's name on this. It's a, it's a big stone. We can put more names on it. It'll have to be turned over. I bet you Kirk could do it. Kirk is, <laughs> Kirk is. No, I mean, I can try. Kirk's on a different adventure right now. Yeah, Kirk's in another world. Out of touch, yeah. <laughs> just let him be out of touch till he lands back where he needs to land. I don't go after them. No. Don't go after them. No. So this storm is her Top name, five. special name. Yes. And at the top of it, what will we say? What? Yeah. Just you want to put name, period, on the stone. Yeah, I think so. I think that's fine. We could put in memory of, I guess, on there. And I'm going to, it will have to turn, it has to be turned over to the better side. And, uh, but I've been wanting this stone for a while since Tim died, and that's a perfect stone. And uh, 
It just showed up. Out there, my style just showed up. <laughs> You've been asking for it. <laughs> so I saw it. I thought, there's my stone. So I, this morning, uh, I, I was telling Diana, she was walking out. I said, uh, I confiscated uh, Tom's stone. Tom says, I've given you that stone. <laughs> that stone belongs to you. So y'all know I own a stone if they give it to me. <laughs> but that's what I want to do with it. But I need to find someone that can paint their names and the date of birth and the date of death. <laughs> On there. Yeah, because on a stone, you just get one shot at it. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, that's what I want to do. And then when when we get it done, I will invite the Sherbecks to come. Carol is still not well. And uh, Joelle has most of the care. Um, when, we, when we all started getting sick around here with COVID, we were helping. Uh, even after the funeral for a while, but then we had people getting sick and we had to take care of those that were in front of us, really, with food and, and helping. So we had a small group to take care of quite a few people. And uh, so Sandra has followed up and called Carol and uh, I've called her a couple of times. So. Anyway, my point is that when we get it painted, I want to invite the family over to see it. Yeah. We'll call out their names. Okay. Yeah. Before God. Yeah. So, just wanted to tell you about my stone. <laughs> and stones speak. Amen. Yeah, stone. Stones hear and stones speak. In Israel, when they visit the graves, they, they take a stone and they put it in the trumpet. Sure do. Yep. They do it in America, too, in the Jewish cemetery. You can see rocks all over the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. We saw that. What else y'all got? We had a quick vision. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it was beautiful and big. Praise God. Amen. Yep. I got equal too. And while you were preaching, Pastor, um, what I got from the message was that the Lord is wanting us to claim our identity that was born in him for our nations to be established again in all these areas where Satan has came in Go ahead and, and take our ground back. Go ahead and pray that song. Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you take back what belongs to you that you have created for our nation. You established our nation. And Lord, I just pray that you take back that ground where Satan has came in and caused havoc with all these spirits and all these demons in all these areas. And Lord, that you take back what belongs to you that you have established here for this Christian nation in all these areas. In the Christian nation where you have established your footprints and your Holy Spirit go and do the work that needs to be done and counsel these people with truth that passes all understanding Well, they will get the right things in salvation, deliverance, healing, restoration, reconciliation in their relationships. Back to you, Lord. They will get in right standing with you and with their relationships with other people as well. And Lord, that they will come back to the church and worship you and not other people. That they will worship you 
and no one else, and that they seek you, and they need to be delivered by you, Lord, in all these areas, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray for Kirk Harris, wherever he is and whatever he's doing, yes. Lord, that you bring him back and do what you have before him, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We don't want to lose, I don't want to lose any that Amen. have been under my care. Yes, Lord.